Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk Live on the Orthodox Christian Network. Sixty-five percent of Americans report viewing some kind of worship or other spiritual content online, which is why in 2021 we offered over 280 programs through MyOCN Community and our online partnerships, reaching over 51,000 people. The Orthodox Christian Network is a 501c3 corporation and a 100% donor-supported ministry. We rely on donors like you to keep these programs free and available, so if you're able, please consider making a contribution today. And as always, please support us through your prayers and by sharing this content with your friends and family. With that, let's get into today's interview. We have a very special program today dealing with a summer institute that I know you're going to want to learn about. But first, let's begin with prayer. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death upon death and bestowing life to those who are in the tombs. St. Vladimir's Seminary and the International Society for Orthodox Church Music are presenting a Summer Music Institute this June 14th through the 18th. The program will be held on the campus in Yonkers, New York, but we'll learn about an online audit option that is also available. The summer program will bring together church musicians of all skill levels for hand-on workshops, lectures, and liturgical services with internationally recognized faculty. The Institute accommodates both the Slavic and Byzantine liturgical music traditions and will provide resources for small and large groups. Let me introduce our two very special guests to you today. Talia Maria Sheehan has been a professional vocalist and music instructor for over 20 years. Her musical background and performance experience is broad. As a professional ensemble singer, she has performed with Capella Romana, the Grammy-nominated St. Ticon Choir, and the Grammy-nominated Patrum Institute Singers. Talia works at St. Ticon's Monastery and Seminary in South Canaan, Pennsylvania. And there she teaches music, voice, theory, liturgical music, and directs a children's choir and a women's choir, I guess, in her spare time. Talia and her husband, composer and conductor Benedict Sheehan, live on the grounds of St. Ticon's with their seven daughters. Our other guest is Dr. Harrison Russell, graduated from the seminary's MDiv program as valedictorian in 2013. He then went on to earn an MA and a PhD degree in musicology from Duke University. His wife, Gabrielle, is also a graduate of St. Vladimir's in 2014 and currently works at the seminary as registrar and student affairs administrators. These two people have a lot of talent in them. Let's start with uh, you, Talia. Talia, tell us about the start. How did this become an actuality, a summer music institute? Well, there's actually kind of a lot of history in that, uh, Father Chris. It's actually um, a, a reiteration, a recapitulation, to make a musical joke, uh, um, <laughs> of a long-standing summer institute that happened at St. Vladimir's um, for many years. It was it was actually something that uh, my husband took me to when we were young young people in music school, undergrads together, and we were dating. Um, and many of the, the great teachers and, and directors of, of the previous generation um, met there every summer. Um, there was a, a period when, when it, um, it didn't happen. And there was always a, a thought in the back of our, our minds, both of the older generation that were guides and teachers, um, and, and thus those of us who, who remembered fondly being participants, young people learning uh, from them, we should do this again. Um, so Harrison can speak a little bit more to the uh, the uh, initiative that came from St. Vladimir's um, and the um, Institute of Sacred Arts at St. Vladimir's, newly founded Institute of Sacred Arts, to re to revitalize this summer institute. Um, people people need uh, they need some reinvigoration after after Pascha, um, so it's a great time to actually come together and and find uh, inspiration for another liturgical year of the self-sacrificial work of sacred music. Very good. And I understand, of course, we're coming, we hope to be coming out of COVID. So that means more people are coming to church, less people online watching it. And I'm sure that reintegration, as you speak about, is going to be very, very beneficial. Well, we're all missing making music together in person. And there were a lot of sacrifices that people made in order to keep singing in worship. Um, and 
some of those sacrifices meant that people actually gained skills they wouldn't have gained had um, the conditions stayed the same. So we're really hoping that this is another one of those one of those blessings that comes out of the, the trial, really, of COVID and, mm -hmm. and of the, uh, the struggles that we all had during that period. Tell us, if you would, Tanya, about the, the actual setup, the in-person program. What kind of environment can people expect? Well, we wanted to really emphasize this year uh, singing together. So many people have been isolated all through the pandemic, and, and quite frankly, many communities have been isolated from each other. And so we thought that if we could provide people who come from perhaps isolated communities, perhaps they are one of only a few um, uh, talented or a few experienced um, church musicians, um, an opportunity to be with peers and colleagues and, and mentors. And so we really emphasize this year rehearsing together, singing together and rehearsing together. And not only singing together and rehearsing together uh, just with colleagues and mentors and friends, but also singing together and rehearsing together across traditions. Um, and we really do feel that uh, it's, it's now the call, uh, the call is being made to those of us in working in church music to find the bridges between our traditions and to find the things that we have in common and to learn from each other, to learn each other's traditions as authentically and, and faithfully as we can and then to nurture the next generation of liturgical music in America. But what about those people who can't attend uh, personally? There's an opportunity, I imagine, to audit the program virtually. Yeah, absolutely. So many things were learned. Um, we learned so many things in, in, in music. Music is a craft. And so it's kind of, um, we have to learn, learn by watching and doing. Uh, it's it's not a it, it's not an academic uh, uh, a pursuit. It can be parts of it can be, um, but it's almost more of a motor skill. So the value of watching somebody do the craft of music is really quite high, um, and we want to provide our auditors. Um, which we hope uh, many, many people will take advantage of the fact that we will be streaming all of the events that happen uh, during our institute. We would like to provide our auditors the opportunity to watch how people are learning, not just watch how experts do things, but to watch how people are learning. That is a really, really powerful, powerful thing to have access to. Very good. I'm, I'm glad to hear you have both. That's great. Uh, Harrison, let me come to you. The program has three tracks, I understand. Uh, conducting, singing, or composing. Can you tell us about the three tracks? Sure. Well, we have three very distinguished professors or instructors in each of those categories. Talia, right here, will be instructing the vocal technique category uh, track. Uh, her husband, Benedict, uh, who is a uh, very recognized composer. Uh, I don't think we need to say any more up and coming composer. He, he has arrived <laughs> as a composer. Uh, uh, in case you don't know, actually, Benedict was uh, just nominated for a Grammy for his own composition of the Divine okay. Liturgy, uh, so I, I highly recommend that recording. And then we have a conducting track, and that will be taught by Juliana Woodill, who is a uh, conductor. Uh, her, her profession is actually as a uh, K-12 through music teacher in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, and she's a very skilled conductor, singer, and church musician. Um, and I actually met her for the first time at uh, St. Vlad's Institute in 2007 when we were both uh, young college students. So it's fun to, to get everyone back together. The idea is that um, everyone will come, uh, everyone who is attending in person will come and everyone will sing together. Everyone will sing in the choir together. We'll sing the services together. We'll have both a very large choir uh, consisting of everyone enrolled so that we're right now uh, we have about 25 students registered uh, we're hoping to get to about 40 so that would be a very large choir indeed especially for an orthodox church and we have um small groups uh and um every so everyone enrolled will be involved in to some degree in the services for the week but in addition to that everyone will have the opportunity to choose a specific track so for some people they'll want to work on composing new music. Now that doesn't need to be uh, some sort of grand entire liturgy. It'll probably be a, a very short piece, maybe some, something uh, that you could work on and really hone in a three day in three days. Uh, other people will choose to really focus on conducting, on gesture, on technique. 
Uh, I would also here emphasize that's not limited just to people in the Russian music tradition. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people, especially from the Greek and, and Byzantine tradition, uh, have conducting, uh, whether or not they realize it. I, I often see chanters, even if they're three chanters, you know, there, there will be one person who's leading, obviously. So it's always a uh, useful skill to, to really hone on those gestures. And then the third track will be uh, for singers, for vo uh, vocal technique. And Atalia, you could speak about that right now if you want. Yeah, well, it's it, as though um, it seems like God had a very particular idea when he said that we were supposed to sing in church to worship him. It, <laughs> it's, it's not it's not uh, a place where a lot of people feel comfortable, even people with a lot of experience. There's a lot of vulnerability involved mm -hmm. in in using your voice. Um, there's no instrument to hide behind. Um, and sometimes those uh, we, we come up with solutions to problems that that maybe aren't the best solutions. And so sometimes even very experienced people can you know, be greatly aided by, by a little bit of focused attention on how they're doing what they have to do all the time. And it's too difficult to do that during your average liturgical cycle. You have to step out. And that's the case for all three disciplines. We wanna give people the chance to step out of the practice of sing, singing the services, of practicing for the services, and look at the skills that they're working on in a sort of detached way so that they can come back into the services using these honed skills to make an even more beautiful, more joyful sound in the worship. I'm gonna step out here on a very careful plank. And that is, I don't wanna be accused of age discrimination here, but I'm gonna ask you the question, which I see in many choirs. Most of the choirs are either white or silver haired. And that means that they're older. That doesn't mean they're bad, but it means they've been doing it a long, long time. And with 60% of the young people leaving the churches around the nation, I'm just wondering, are you seeing a younger group coming in to support this older group so that as they retire, there's somebody to take their place? Either one of you could take that question, hmm. if you dare. Well, I, I'll say uh, to begin, um, I, I grew up singing. I grew up in a very musical household. Uh, everyone, I have five siblings and we all grew up playing music, but that's certainly not the norm, especially today. Uh, I know that people of my father and my mother's generation really did have singing and music as, as a, uh, a communal event. It, it was uh, something that really bound everyone together. Uh, my, neither of my parents would really consider themselves professional singers, but it's still something that we always did uh, growing up. Uh, I, and that's really not the norm anymore. So I, I think in one sense, it is a generational issue. Uh, Talia uh, and actually has, uh, with her husband, another Endeavor uh, artifact, which is really dedicated to uh, reintegrating not just music, but especially music uh, as a, uh, l l let's say, a... Um, uh, a household uh, tool, uh, so something that we can really come around uh, together. So I, I actually don't know. We haven't been asking for uh, dates of birth or ages for the registrants. So I, I don't know how our registration is skewing. Uh, but uh, I know we do have quite a few uh, really involved young people. Uh, my only concern with that, as you, as you noted, Father Chris, is that a lot of the young people in music uh, are really kind of shoehorned in that direction. And a lot of people, maybe, you know, they go to elementary school choir and the teacher says, you can't sing, don't sing, or, or you know, just move, just move your lips. Um, I, I know in my professional experience, I get students every year training for the priesthood, training for the diaconate, who that was their experience. They were told not to sing at age eight and they have never sung since then. Wow. And it, it really is, um, it's, uh, obviously, as, as clergy in our church, uh, singing is a large part of your job. Uh, I, I would estimate probably 90% of your liturgical service is, is singing. Yes, and, is. Yeah, so, so really um, developing, uh, as Talia said, developing the voice that, that God has given us, which is the voice that we have to worship. Uh, Talia, do you want to add? I've seen yeah. a couple of uh, television programs where they ask young people, uh, can you name the four evangelists? Mm. And uh, people say, no. Uh, can you give us the top rap song? Bang, bang, bang. And they can give it right to you and they can give you all the lyrics. Sure. 
but we somehow are not where we need to be as a faith in America, where people, instead of knowing the rap songs, also know some of the sacred hymns that really give them life and abundant life as Paul speaks about it. Tanya, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, well, I, I think, Father Chris, you point out a thing that really is, is the crux of the issue, that, that there is, it, it's hard to know how to receive a tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that it's really, really important to do is for generations to learn from each other. And we absolutely want um, the younger generation of faithful to learn from the older generation. Sure. But we also want the older generation to learn from the younger generation because we have new, new problems now. And uh, as a parent, I know that I now have to turn to my children to solve problems for me more often than I would like to admit. But it does, they do provide, um, you know, a, a much, much fresher perspective and sometimes, you know, sometimes a painfully honest perspective, but a fresh perspective on, on what's really, what's really being, um, being challenging. And we're just better together. So one of the things we wanna make sure that we do in this program is that we allow room for people who are learning to mess up mm -hmm. and not to, have, not to have it fail, not to have things fall apart. And I also know as a parent and as an instructor that the anxiety about letting someone who's learning, you know, kind of take the wheel as it were, <laughs> that's not even a metaphor, that's an anxiety for me, letting right. my kids take the wheel. Um, it's, really, it's, quite, it's quite dramatic. What happens if the service falls apart? Well, that will be uncomfortable. But, you know, John could direct the service. We just have to be okay with John risking the service falling apart. So there's a, there's a mutual handing back and forth that does need to come. We're going to try and do that in, a, in, in actually in a couple ways with this program. One being that, um, you know, letting people who are learning have a chance to, to be at the helm. The student conductors will conduct portions of the services. They will have to rehearse the small ensembles that they're in charge of, um, have to, they will get to, they will get to rehearse the small ensembles. Um, but there will also be some, you know, it's a great word in education, scaffolding around them, um, not only in the process, how they learn, but also in terms of having, having people with a lot of experience there. Um, so obviously the faculty are very experienced. There's a lot of people with 10,000 hours that are gonna come to this. Um, and we also are inviting people from the previous generations of this beautiful um, institute to come and, and be present and offer their advice and expertise and, and feedback to how, how things are going. We really believe that the more people have a chance to try out this, this work of worship, mm -hmm. which is extraordinarily complex, it's such a refined art, it's like ballet the better they're going to get at it and the more they're going to see themselves as a person who does it. Well, I like the idea of the scaffolding. That gives me a real secure future as if you're building something. Uh, let yeah. me go back to Harrison for a minute. Um, uniquely, this program accommodates both the Byzantine and the Slavic traditions. I only know the Byzantine tradition that was brought up in the Greek Orthodox Church, but I know when I go to a church that uses the Slavic tradition, I don't know where I am many times. So how do you blend? How do you study both traditions and, and choose according to the needs of these folks? Sure. Well, to start off, we have uh, an incredibly talented chanter coming, John Michael Boyer, uh, who uh, lives in, the, uh, in Portland. Um, I was gonna say in the Portland area, but I'm pretty sure he lives in the city of Portland. Uh, and he sings with Capella Romana. He is uh, one of their musical directors and he will be uh, in residence. Now in the past we've done it or other iterations of this institute have done it where you, you choose either you will do Byzantine or you will do the Slavic style. And Talia, uh, and I credit this to, to really her, her vision uh, really wanted to integrate uh, people from both traditions and, and not really have this kind of bifurcation where you choose one or the other. And one uh, really important asset of having John Michael teach is that he, he can really teach people starting from zero. He's a, a very skilled chanter and a very good teacher. Uh, he's done also a lot of transcriptions. So he, he's, uh, a lot of his music will actually have the Byzantine notation and the Western style notation right next to each other. So you can choose one or the other. He's done a lot of work translating from Greek into English so that there won't be a problem for people who don't know Greek. So our hope uh, and our expectation is that 
uh, people will be able to come together and sing the Byzantine chant under expert guidance and then sing the Russian Orthodox chant under really expert guidance as well. The one issue that actually we talked about was, um, and, and Talia mentioned this talking about uh, the COVID restrictions that have really affected choirs. In the Russian tradition, we're often very used to having a large choir, at least four people, preferably double that, preferably eight people, I would say two, two sopranos, two altos, two tenors, two basses is, is a good sized choir for, for a Sunday. And in, in COVID, a lot of us were restricted. Uh, some churches were having one singer. Uh, some churches, you know, had maybe had two, four singers at, at that time. Uh, whereas in the Byzantine tradition, it's often the opposite problem. Uh, every week there will be one chanter, but actually to expand from one chanter to a larger choir, let's say eight people, is fairly difficult. There are obviously choirs that do that. Uh, I, I, I'm sure we've heard the the, the choir of Batopedi. Uh, they're you know, all over uh, YouTube and Spotify, or, or many of these these uh, acclaimed Greek choirs are are just incredible and it sounds yeah, it sounds like they're singing with one voice but there are actually you know eight men or, or 12 men are singing so our hope is that uh, under john michael's direction we'll be able to go from uh this this tradition which especially in america is often limited to to one or two chanters and really uh have a choral chant sound so so that's that's what our hope is with that okay well even in in the greek orthodox church you may have a chanter but you've also got a choir that sure. more you know, nine times out of 10 is using Western music. Right. So you do have a blend uh, within the two. And for the most part, it works with 15, 20, 25, 30 people uh, in that choir, in addition to a chanter, maybe one, maybe two, maybe three. Um, so it's a tradition and something that we continue, but something that we have to keep alive, as we said. It's part of who we are. Uh, Taya, let me come to you for a minute and let's talk about uh, music programs in general in the church. Why is it important, do you feel, to increase music education in the church? And who should consider participating in the program that you folks are offering? Oh, absolutely. Well, that's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I would say that there is, I think, uh, I might have said, I think, I think there's a particular reason why God asks us to sing in worship. It's one of the riskiest things that we do as people because there's nothing to hide behind. There's no way to, you know, lay the blame of our poor singing on, you know, oh, this instrument, it's, I don't know, something's wrong with it. I should get it tuned or the valves are stuck, you know, oh, this is a terrible read. What about, the person, next to me? what about the person next to me who's off key? What do you do with that? Oh, we can try to hide behind <laughs> them too. I mean, that's a thing that's done pretty, okay. pretty often. All right. um, no, it, singing is like, um, uh, I, I think, and, and I also train seminarians. Um, the, I think it is, is a, it's a great, um, it's a great injustice that no one tells these beautiful uh, men who are uh, pursuing priestly formation that they will have to be a soloist, a solo singer for like 90% of their professional, uh, you know, uh, uh, at least their public, uh, you know, professional demands. Um, and I know that's really very, very difficult for, for some very brave, very competent people, the prospect of singing. Um, I had a student who was an active duty combat vet, several tours in the Middle East. He said, I'd rather be shot at. And he was not exaggerating. <laughs> I hope he sees this so he can see that I speak about him in public. Um, and it's true. Some people would genuinely rather be shot at than, than sing publicly, which is such a tragedy. I think singing and the study of singing and the, the determination to be brave enough to sing in worship in praise of the God who has given us everything is the, the kindest and most beautiful incremental exposure therapy to fear that we have. Mm. It's a way to be afraid and to have to be brave in the face of your fear that's beautiful, that is inspiring to other people because everybody knows when someone has gotten over some fear and actually done it. We can hear that. And the fact that that's baked into every moment of our worship, that's not by accident. So okay. whether someone sings in church or sings someplace else, the fact that we are singing to God as uh, th in thanksgiving 
is it tells us something about what he wants, how he wants us to be and how even when things are hard, he wants them, wants those hard things to be beautiful and enjoyable um, and, and for them to eventually feel good. And they, and it does singing, um, singing is one of the, uh, you know, getting uh, sort of like uh, neurochemistry here. Singing is one of the free sources of dopamine. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are remarkable, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, receptors for positive emotion that just go off like fireworks when we sing, especially when we sing with other people. It, in, in, it inspires trust. Um, it creates a kind of sensitivity to your brother and sister that you wouldn't have a chance to practice otherwise. And it's on, it's on display. Um, so those are the sort of existential reasons. There's all sorts of really beautiful sort of institutional reasons why we should learn to sing. The, the worship should be our first fruits. Um, uh, and if we, if we make things beautiful in church, then it says something about who we believe God is. So it's hard. It's hard. It, it, it needs support. You need support from your peers and colleagues and mentors to be able to do it. And it's also a lifetime's worth of, of engaging study. Um, so we want to bring people who are, who are interested, um, you know, who should attend this, um, people who are interested, but inexperienced, um, because there will be people there to support them. And if they fall, there'll be someone to catch them. People who are experienced, but not educated. And that's a, that's a significant, uh, population in, yeah. in church musicians, a yes. wealth of experience, but not a lot of technical, um, technical education. Okay. Um, and, and the people who are experienced and educated, um, you know, those are generations and we want all of the generations of, of people working in this, um, in this craft, in this, in this laboring, in this vineyard, uh, to be together and support each other. I was going to ask you another question, but I, I believe you really answered it. And that is, what do you do with the people who are interest are not interested in a career in music? Those who just have no concern whatsoever. My concern as a priest of four decades is that we are trying to create the kingdom of heaven on earth. So when folks are in there and they're worshiping and praying and singing, they're creating that kingdom of heaven, that perfect kingdom on earth. And that is a frightening thing, as you've said beautifully, but it's also something which frees us and allows us to come into communion with the God of our universe. It's, uh, music is so much a part of our lives. It really, really is. Um, let me go on, just ask you some, just to make some final comments that you might have. And then we'll talk a little more about how people can get involved in this and learn more about it. So Harrison, let me come to you first. Any final comments? Sure, just to echo uh, Talia's final uh, or her most recent comments, I'll say that um, we, we want and we love and we crave beauty in our churches and our worship, as you just said, Father Chris. And music is an art that requires constant maintenance. I'm, I'm a pianist, and if I don't practice for a few days, I can feel it, I know it. Uh, we can go into a church and really adore the iconography. And you know, it was painted 20 years ago, 50 years ago. And, it doesn't really require that much maintenance. Maybe you'll have someone come in every every 10 years and touch it up, but once it's painted, it's painted. Music is the exact opposite. It requires constant attention, constant care, constant rehearsal. And we really uh, owe it, it not, not just, um, not just, I mean, we, we obviously owe it to God. We, we, I mean, we sing that every week, that it is you that we sing and it is you that we praise and you, we, him. Uh, but we owe it really uh, to, to the artistic and um, worship tradition of the church to have beautiful music in addition to beautiful churches and beautiful liturgy and beautiful iconography. So I'll, I'll end there. Okay, very good. Tanya, any final comments from you? Well, I hope that people know that 
if they're able to come in person, um, we will be overjoyed to see them, but that we, we really do hope that if you're not able to come in person, that you consider um, registering as an auditor for this program. Um, if you're in a different time zone or if you are busy during the day, and even though our program, um, many of our sessions are going to be doing during the day, and you register as an auditor, you're help, you'll have access to the recordings of our sessions and the resources that get shared um, with those sessions. So one of the things we need to try to do is, is not let anybody flounder alone and to not, if at all possible, to keep reinventing the wheel. So to share our resources, to gather someplace centrally um, and to learn how to reach out to each other to get the support that we need to do this very challenging, very important work. And where do people go to register? Because it's very, very important. We have folks that are listening to us at OCN, the many platforms we have in over 190 countries. So people could be joining you from any country in the world if they hear this and they're inspired. So would you please tell us how people can register? Sure, the easiest place is www.svots.edu. That's the St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary website. And there is a, a scrolling banner, a scrolling banner at the top, which will have a, a picture of Talia singing and that it will say Summer Music Institute. And also uh, further down on the page, there's a place. And we are also accepting applications for financial assistance okay. if people wish to attend but don't have the financial resources to. And what is the cost of the uh, seminar? The attendance charge to participate in the Institute this year in person for full in-person attendance for four days with meals is $415. So we'll be offering meals every day. Um, and you know, it's gonna be wonderful to get to eat with all of the people that you're studying with and have that fellowship time. Uh, we will not be offering uh, on-campus lodging this year, um, but there is nearby hotel accommodations. Um, and we're uh, connecting people if they would like to share accommodations with another attendee or um, what have you, we will connect you with uh, other participants if you're interested. Um, and the virtual attendance fee is only $150. And again, with that virtual attendance, you get access to recordings of all the events and resources that you can uh, consume and enjoy at your, own, uh, at your own pace. And how long again is the program? We mentioned in the beginning, but I'd like you to say it again. Sure, it'll begin on the evening of Tuesday, June 14th. Uh, with a lecture, Vespers and a lecture, and we'll end on Saturday morning, June 18th, with a uh, divine liturgy. Excellent. Very, very good. Give us again, please, the website, and we'll post it as well. Give us that website where folks can go to register. Of course. svots.edu. Very good. Tanya Harrison, thank you for being with us today. Please give our very best to our good friends at both St. Vladimir's and St. Tikhon's. We wish the two of you and your families many, many blessings. And we pray this will be extremely successful. Thank Let's you. close with a prayer. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling death upon death, and bestowing life to those who are in the tombs. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. You can find all of our upcoming events at myocn.net, in addition to daily articles, live worship links, and other resources. We hope you'll join us again. And until then, thank you. Thank you.